Live from San Jose, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data Silicon Valley 2017. Hello and welcome to theCUBE special coverage of Big Data SV, Big Data in Silicon Valley in conjunction with Strata Hadoop. I'm John Furrier with George Gilbert with Mookie Bond and Peter Burris as well. We'll be doing interviews all day, today and tomorrow here in Silicon Valley in San Jose. Our next guest is Mitt Wally, who's the Executive Vice President, Chief Product Officer of Informatica. Kicking off the day one of our coverage. Great to see you, thanks for joining us on our, on our kickoff. Good to be here with you, John. So, uh, obviously big data, this is like uh, the eighth year of us covering what was once Hadoop World, yeah. now it's Strata Hadoop, Big Data SV, we also do Big Data NYC uh, with theCUBE, and it's been an interesting transformation <laughs> over the past eight years. This year has been really, really hot with, you're starting to see big data starting to get uh, a clear line of sight of where mm -hmm. it's going. So I want to get your thoughts, Amit, on where the, uh, the view of the marketplace is from your standpoint. Obviously, yeah. Informatica's got a big place in the enterprise. And the real trends in how the enterprises are, are taking analytics. And specifically with the cloud, you got the AI looming, all, all buzzed up on AI. That really sees, sees uh, the, the people have to get their arms around that. And you see IOT, Intel announced an acquisition of $15 billion mm -hmm. for autonomous vehicles, which is essentially data. What's your views? Well, I, I think it's a great question. 10 years have happened since Hadoop started, right? I think what has happened as we see is that today what enterprises are trying to encapsulate around is what they call digital transformation. And what does it mean? I mean, think about a digital transformation for enterprises it means three unique things. They are transforming their business models to serve their customers better. They're transforming their operational models for their own execution internally, uh, if, if I'm a manufacturing or an execution-oriented company. And the third one is basically making sure that their offerings are also tailored to their customers. And in that context, if you think about it, it's all a data-driven world, because it's data that helps customers be more insightful, be more actionable, and be a lot more prepared for the future. And that covers the things that you said, look, that's where Hadoop came into play with big data. But today, the three things that organizations are catered around big data is there's a lot of data, right? How do I bring actionable insights out of it? So in that context, ML and AI are going to play a meaningful role. Because to me, as you talked about IoT, IoT is the big game changer of big data becoming big, or huge <laughs> data, if I may, for a minute. So machine learning AI, self-service analytics as a part of that, and the third one would be big data or Hadoop going to cloud. That's going to be very fast. And so the enterprises now are also transformed. So this digital transformation, as uh -huh. you point out, is, is absolutely real, it's happening. And you start to see a lot more focus on the business models of companies, where yeah. it's not just analytics as an IT function. Yes. And it's been talked about for a while, but now it's really more, more relevant because you're starting to see impactful exactly. applications. Mm -hmm. So with cloud and the new IoT stuff, you're starting to see, okay, apps matter and so the, the data becomes super important. How is that changing the enterprise's readiness in terms of how they're consuming cloud and data and whatnot? What's your view on that? Because you guys are deep in this. What's, yep. what's the enterprise's orientation these days? So slight nuance to that uh, as answer. I think what organizations have realized is that the, today two things happened that never happened in the last 20 years. Massive fragmentation of the persistence layer. You see Hadoop itself fragmented the whole database layer and a massive fragmentation of the app layer. So there are 3,000 enterprise SaaS apps today. So just think about it. You're not restricted to one app. So what customers and enterprises are realizing is that the data layer is where you need to organize yourself. So you need to own the data layer. You cannot just be in the app layer and the database layer because you've got to be understanding your data because you could be anywhere and everywhere. And the best example I give in the world of cloud is you don't own anything. You rent it. So what do you own? You own the darn data. So in that context, enterprise readiness as you came to it becomes very important. So understanding and owning your data is the critical secret sauce. And that's why companies are getting disrupted. So the new guys are leveraging data, which by the way, the legacy yeah. companies had, but they couldn't figure it out. What is that? What is that? This is important. I want to just double click on that because you mentioned the data layer. What's the playbook? Because that's like the number one question I get mm -hmm. on CUBE interviews or off camera is that, okay, I want to have a data strategy. Mm -hmm. now, that's empty. In its, in, its, in its statement, but what is the playbook? I mean, is it architecture? Because the data is a strategic advantage. Yes. What are they doing? What's the architecture? What are some of the things that enterprises do? Obviously they care about service level agreements and having potentially multi-cloud, for instance, as a key thing, but what is that playbook for this that's data a, That's layer? a very good question. So enterprise readiness has a couple of dimensions. So one you said is that there will be a hybrid, doesn't mean a ground cloud, multi-cloud. I mean, you're going to be in multi-SaaS apps, multi-platform apps, multi-databases in the cloud. So there is a hybrid world over there. Second is, 
that organizations need to figure out a data platform of their own because ultimately what they care for is that do I have a full view of my customer do I, or I have a full view of the products that I'm selling and how they are servicing my customers. That can only happen if you have what I call a metadata driven data platform. Third one is boy oh boy, you talked about self-service. Analytics, you need to know answers today. Having analytics be more self-serving for the business user, not necessarily the IT user and then leveraging AI to make all these things a lot more powerful. Otherwise, you're gonna be spending, what, hours and hours doing statistical analysis, and you won't be able to get to it given the <laughs> scale and size of data models. And SLAs will play a big role in the world of cloud. Just to follow up on that, so it sounds like you've got the self-service analytics to help essentially explore and visualize. Mm -hmm. You've got the uh, data governance and cataloging and um, lineage to make sure it's high quality um, and navigable, uh, and then you want to operationalize it once you've built the models. But there's this tension between, I want what made the data lake great, which was just dump it all in there so we have this one central place, but all the governance stuff that on, on top of that is sort of the, well, we got to organize it anyway. Yep. How do you resolve that tension? That is a very good question, and that's where enterprises kind of woke up to. So a good example I'll give you, what everybody wanted to make, make a data lake. I mean, if you remember two years ago, 80% of the data lakes fell apart. And the reason was for the fact that you just said is that people made the data lake a data swamp, if I may. Just dump a lot of data into my Hadoop cluster and life will be great. But the thing is that, what, and, and what customers or large enterprises realize is they became system integrators of their own. I had to bring data, catalog it, prepare it, surface it. So the belief that customers are now is that I need a place to go where basically I can easily bring in all the data, metadata driven catalog, so I can use AI and ML to surface that data. So it's very easy at the preparation layer for my analyst to go around and play with data and then I can visualize anything. But it's all integrated out of the box, then each layer, each component being self-integrated and it falls apart very quickly when you want to, to your question, at an enterprise level, operationalize it. Large enterprises care about two things. Is it operationalizable and is it scalable? That's where it is to fall apart. And that's what our belief is. And that's where governance happens behind the scenes. You're not doing anything. Security of your data, governance of your data is driven through the catalog. You don't even feel it, it's there. I never liked the data lake uh, term. Dave Vellante knows I've always been kind of against, even from day one, because data is more fluid. I call it a data ocean, but th to your point, I want to get on that point because I think data lakes is one dimension, right? Yep. And we talked about this at Informatica World last year, and I think and this year it's May 15th, I think your yes. event is coming on, but you guys introduced metadata intelligence. Yep. So there was the, the old model was throw it centralized, do some data governance, data management, fence it out, call, make some queries, get some reports, I'm oversimplifying, but it's, it, was like a, it was like a side function. You're getting at now is making that data valuable. Yeah. So if it's in a lake or where it's stored, you never know when the data is going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. So you have to have it addressable. Could you just talk about where this metadata intelligence is going? Because you mentioned a machine learning and mm -hmm. AI. Because this seems to be what everyone's talking about in real time. How do I make the data really valuable when I need it? Mm -hmm. And what's the, and what's the secret sauce that you guys have specifically to make that happen? Th so that to contextualize that question, think about it. So if you what what you don't want to do is keep make everything manual. Our belief is that the intelligence around data has to be at the metadata level, right? Across the enterprise, which is why when we invested in the catalog, I use the word, it's the Google of data for the enterprise. Now, no place in an enterprise you can go search for all your data. And given that the fast, rapid changing sources of data, think about IoT as you talked about, John, or think about your customer data for you and me may come from a new source tomorrow. Do you want the analyst to figure out where the data is coming from or the machine learning or AI to contextualize and tell you, you know what, I just discovered a great new source for where John is going to go shop. You want to put that as a part of analytics to give him an offer. That's where the organizing principle for data sits, the catalog, and all the metadata, which is where ML and AI will converge to give the analyst self-discovery of data sets, recommendations like an Amazon uh, environment, recommendations like Facebook, find other people or other common data sets like a, like a Facebook or a LinkedIn, that is where everything is going, and that's where we are putting all our efforts on AI. So you're saying you want to abstract away the complexity of where the data sits so yes. that the analyst or app can interface with that. 
That's right. exactly right. Because to me, those are the areas that are changing so rapidly. Let that be. You can pick wherever data sits based on yeah. what you want. You can pick whichever app you want to use wherever you want to go or wherever business wants to go. You can pick, pick whichever analytical tool you like. But you want to be able to take all of those tools but be able to figure out what data is there and that shouldn't change all the time. I've got to ask you a lot while you're here. What's the what's going to be the theme this year at Informatica World? How do you take it to the next level? Can you just give us a teaser of what we might expect this year? Because this seems to be the hottest trend. This is so. First, at Informatica World this year, we'll be unveiling our whole new uh, you know strategy, branding, and messaging. There's a whole amount of push on that one. But the two things that we'll be focused a lot on is one is around that intelligent data platform, mm -hmm. which is basically what I'm talking about, the organizing principle of every, every enterprise for the next decade, and within that where AI is going to play a meaningful role for people to spring forward, discover things, self-service, and be able to create sense from this mountains of data that's going to sit around us, but we won't even know what to do. All right, so what do you guys have in the product? Just want to drill into this dynamic you just mentioned, which is new data sources. And with IoT, this is going to completely make it more complex. You never know what data is going to be coming off the cars, the wearables, the smart cities. You have all these new you know, killer use cases mm -hmm. that are going to be transformational. How do you guys handle that, and what's the secret sauce of, because that seems to be the big challenge, okay? I'm used to dealing with data, it's structured, whether it's schemas, now yep. I got unstructured. So, okay, now I got new data coming in very fast. I don't yep. even know when or where it's going to come in, so uh -huh. I have to be ready for <laughs> these yeah, new yeah. data. What is, uh, what is the Informatica uh, solution there? So in terms of picking data from any source, that's never been a challenge for us, because Informatica, one of the bread and butter for us is that we connect and bring data from any potential source on the planet. That's what we do. And you so automate that. We automate that process, so any potential new source of data, whether it's IoT, unstructured, semi-structured, log, we connect to that. Where I think the key is, where we are heavily invested, once you've brought all that, by the way, you can use Kafka queues for that, you can use Spark Streaming, all that stuff you could do. Question is, how do you make sense out of it? I can get all the data, dump it on a mm -hmm. Kafka queue, and then I take it to do, do some processing on Spark. But the intelligence is where all the in Informatica secret sauce is, right? Yeah. The metadata, the transformations, that's what we are invested in. But in terms of connecting anything to everything, that we do for a living, we've done that for a one quarter of a decade, and we'll, uh, one quarter of a century, and we keep doing it. I mean, I love having a chat with you, Mid. You're a product guy, and we love product guys because they can, they can give us a little teaser on the roadmap. But I got to ask you the question with all this automation, you know, the big buzz out in the world is, oh, machine learning and AI is replacing yes. jobs. Yeah. So where is the shift going to be? Because you can almost connect the dots and say, okay, you're going to put some people out of work, some developers, some automation, maybe at the systems management layer or wherever. Um, where are those jobs shifting to? Because you can almost say, okay, if you're going to abstract away and automate, who loses their job, who, uh, who gets shifted, and what are those new opportunities? Because you could almost say, if you automate it in, that should create a new developer class. Yep. So one gets replaced, one gets created, possibly. Your thoughts on this, this personnel transformation? Yeah, I think, I think what we see is that value creation will change. So the jobs will go to the new value, uh, new areas where value is created. A great example of that is, look, developers today, right? Absolutely, I think they did a terrific job in making sure that the Hadoop ecosystem got legitimized, right? But in my opinion, when enterprise scalability comes, enterprises don't want lots of different things to be integrated and, and just plumbed together. They want things to work out of the box, which is why you know, software yeah. works for them. But what happens is that they want that development uh, community to go work on what I call value-added areas of the stack. So think about it, in connected car, they're working with lots of customers on the connected car initiative, right? They don't want developers to work on the plumbing. They want us to kind of give that out of the box because SLAs, operational scale, and enterprise scalability matters. But in terms of the top layer analytics, to make sure we can make sense out of it, that's what they that's where they want innovation. So you what you will see is that I don't think the jobs will go away per se, but mm -hmm. I do think that the jobs will get migrated to a different part of the stack, which today it has not been. But that's, you know, we live in Silicon yeah. Valley, that's a natural evolution we see. So I think that'll happen. Uh, in general, in the larger industry, again, I'd say, look, driverless cars, I don't think they've driven away jobs. What they've done is created a new yeah. class of uh, people who work. So I don't think, I do think that'll, that will be a big yeah, there's change. There's a fallacy there. I mean, the ATM argument was ATMs were going to replace tellers yet. More branches open up, so therefore it created That's exactly net right. new jobs. Um, I want to get to the quick question. I know George has a question, but I want to get on the cost of ownership. Because one of the things that's been criticized in some of these emerging areas, like Hadoop and OpenStack, for instance, just to, to pick two random examples, is it's great, looks good, I, you know, all peace and love, and industry is being created to legitimize, but the cost of ownership has been critical mm -hmm. to get that done. It's been expensive, talent, fine talent, and deploying it 
was hard. We've yep. heard that on theCUBE many times. How, how does the cost of ownership equation change as you go after these more value, as developers and businesses go after them, these more value uh, creating activities in the stack? See, look, I always say there is no free lunch. <laughs> Nothing is free. So, and customers realize that, that open source, if you completely wanted to, to your point, as enterprises wanted to completely scale out and create an end-to-end -end operational infrastructure, open source ends up being pretty expensive. Uh, for all the reasons, right? Because you have to throw in a lot of developers and it's not necessarily scalable. So what we are seeing right now is enterprises, as they have figured out that this works for me, but when they want to go scale it out, they want to go back to what I call a software provider who has the scale, who has the supportability, who also has the ability to react to changes and, and also for them to make sure that they get the comfort that it'll work. So to me, that's where they find it cheaper. Just building it, experimenting with that, it's cheaper here but scaling it out is cheaper with a software provider. So we see a lot of our customers who may start a little bit experimenting, two developers, downloading something, works great, but then when I really want to take it across a uh, Nordstrom or a JP Morgan or a Morgan Stanley, I need security, I need scalability, I need somebody to call to, and at that point all those equations become very important. And that's where the out of, out of the box experience exactly comes it. in, where you've got the automation, that kind of, exactly. does that ease up some of the cost exactly. of ownership? Exactly, and, 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 and the talent is a big issue, right? See, we live in Silicon Valley, so yeah. we all, by the way, Silicon Valley hiring talent is hard. Just think about it, if you go to Kansas City, hiring a Scala developer, that's a rare breed. So yeah. just, when I go around the globe and talk to customers, they, they don't see that talent at all that we here just somehow take for granted, yeah. they don't. So yeah. it's hard for them to kind of put their energy behind it. Let me ask, um, uh, more on the on the metadata layer. The, there's an analogy that's come up uh, from the IIoT world where they're building these digital twins, and it's not just GE. IBM's talking about it, and actually, um, we've seen more and more vendors where the digital twin is this. It's a, a, a digital representation now of some physical object, but you could think of it as um, metadata, mm -hmm. you know, for a physical object and it gets richer over time. So, um, my question is, metadata in, in the old data warehouse world was, we want one representation of the customer, but now it's, there's a customer representation for a prospect, mm -hmm. and one for an account, exactly. and one for, you know, in warranty, and one for field service. Is that, how does that change what you offer? That's a very, very good question. Because that's where the metadata becomes so much more important because its manifestation is changing. I'll give you a great example. Take Transamerica. Transamerica is a customer of ours and they are leveraging big data at scale. And what they're doing is that, to your question, they have existing customers who have insurance through them, but they're looking for white space analysis who could be potential opportunities. Two distinct ones. And within that, they're looking at relationships. I know you, John, you have Transamerica, could you be an influencer with me? Or within your family, extended family, I'm a friend, but what about a family member that you have declared out there in social media? So they are doing all that stuff in the context of a data lake. How are they doing it? So in that context, think about that complexity of the job. Yeah. Pumping data into a lake won't solve it for them, but that's a necessary first step. The second step is where all of that metadata through ML and AI starts giving them that relationship graph to say, you know what? John in itself has this white space opportunity for you, but John's related to me in one way, him and me are connected on Facebook, John's related to you a little bit more differently, he has a stronger bond with you, and within his family he has different strong bonds. So that's John's relationship graph, leverage him if he has been a good customer of yours. All of that stuff is now at the metadata level, not just a monolithic metadata, relationship graph. His relationship graph of what he has bought from you. So you can just see that discovery becomes a very important element. Do you want to do that in different places? You want to do that in one place. Yeah. I may be in a cloud environment, I may be on-prem. So that's where when I say that metadata becomes the organized principle, that's where it becomes real. Just a quick follow-up on that then. Um, it doesn't seem obvious that every end customer of yours, not the consumer, but the, the buyer of the software, would have enough data to start building that graph. I don't you see, to me what happened was, the word big data, I thought got massively abused. Yeah. A lot of Hadoop customers are not necessarily big data customers. I know a lot of banking customers, enterprise banking, whose data volumes will surprise you, but they're using Hadoop. What they want is intelligence. That's why I keep saying that the metadata part, they are more interested in the deeper understanding of the data. A great example is, if John, I had a customer who basically had a big bank, 
rich net worth customer in their will the daughter was listed when the daughter went to school by the way went to the bank branch in that city she had no idea she walked up she basically wanted to open an account three more friends in the line manager comes out because at that point the teller said this is somebody you should take special care of boom she goes in a special uh, cabin so the other friends are standing in a line think of the customer service perception we just created in a millennial, right? The, the That's brain, important. Well, this, not, is, this, this brings up the interesting comment, the whole graph thing we love, but this brings up back the neural network yes. uh, trend, which is a concept that's been around for a long, long time, but now it's front and center. I remember talking to Diane Green, who runs Google Cloud. She was saying that you couldn't, you, you couldn't hire a neural network. They couldn't get jobs mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Yeah. Now you can't hire enough of them. So that brings up the, the ML conversation. So I want to I want to take that to a question and ask about the, the, the data lake because you guys have announced a new cloud data yes. lake. So it sounds like from what you're saying is you're going beyond the data lake. Mm -hmm. So talk about what that is because data lake people get you throw stuff into a lake and hopefully it doesn't become a swamp. How are you guys going beyond just the basic concept of a data lake with your new cloud? Data Lake. Yeah, so Data Lake, if you remember last year, actually at Strada San Jose, we chatted and we had announced the Data Lake because we realized customers, to your point, uh, John, as you said, were struggling on how to even build a Data Lake and they were all over the place and they were failing. And we announced the first Data Lake there and then in Strada New York, basically we brought the metadata ML part to the Data Lake and then obviously right now we're taking it to the cloud. And what we see in the world of Data Lake is that customers ask for three things. First, they want a pre-built integrated solution. Data comes come in, but mm -hmm. I want the intelligence of metadata and I want data preparation baked in. I don't want to have three different tools that I will mm -hmm. go around, so out of the box. But we also saw as they become successful with our customers, they want to scale up, scale down. Cloud is just a great place to go. Right, you can basically put a data lake out there. By the way, in the context of data, a lot of new data sources are in the cloud, so it's easy for them to scale in and out in the cloud, experiment there and all that stuff. Also, you know Amazon, we supported Amazon Kinesis, all of these new sources or new technologies in the world of cloud are allowing experimentation in the data lake. So that allowed our yeah. customers to basically get ahead of the curve very quickly. So in some ways, cloud allowed customers to do things a lot faster, better, and cheaper. So that's what we basically put in the hands of our customers. Now that they are feeling comfortable, they can, they can do a secured and governed data lake without feeling that it's still not self-served. They want to put it in the cloud and be a lot more faster and cheaper about and it. And more analytics on it. More analytics. And, allow ML and, 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 and now, and because our ML, our AI, the metadata part, connects cloud, ground, everything, yeah. so they have an organizing principle, whatever they put wherever, that they can still get intelligence out of it. I mean, we got a break, but I want to get one final comment for you to kind of end the segment, and it's been fun watching you guys work over the past couple of years, and I want to get your perspective, because the product decisions always have kind of a, a timetable, so it's not like you made this up last night, because mm -hmm. it's trendy, but you guys have made some good product choices. Seems like the, the, the wind's at your back right now at Informatica. What specifically bets that you guys made a couple of years ago that are now bearing fruit? What, can you just take a minute to end the segment to share some of those product bets, because it's not always that obvious to make those product bets years earlier seems to be a tailwind for you. You agree, and can you share some of those bets? No, I think uh, you, you said it rightly, product bets are hard, right? Because you got to see three, four years ahead. The one big bet that we made is that we saw, as I said to you, the decoupling of the data layer. So we realized that, look, the app layer is getting fragmented, the cloud platforms are getting fragmented, databases are getting fragmented, that that whole old monolithic uh, architecture is getting fundamentally blown up, and the customers will be in a multi, multi, multi spread out hybrid world. Data is the organizing principle, so three years ago, we bet on the intelligent data platform. And we said that the intelligent data platform will be intelligent because of the metadata driven layer, and at that point, AI was nowhere yeah. in, in sight. We put ML in that picture, yeah. and obviously AI has moved. So the bet on the data platform Second bet that in that data platform, it will all be AI, ML driven, metadata intelligence. And the third one is we bet big on cloud. Big data we had already bet big on, by the way. Yeah, you knew already there. We you knew that. that cloud, big data will move to the cloud far more rapidly than the old technology moved to the cloud. So we saw that coming, we saw the Redshift HD Inside Wave coming, yeah. we worked so closely with AWS and the Azure team, yeah. uh, with Google now as well. So we saw three things. And that's what we bet, and you can see the rich offerings we have, yeah. the rich partnerships we have, and the rich customers yeah. that are live in those. And the platforms. market's right on your doorstep. I mean, AI is hot, ML, you're seeing all this stuff converge with so, IoT. So those were some, I think, forward-looking bets. They've paid out for us, <laughs> and but just so much more to do, and yeah. so much more upside for all of us right yeah. now. A lot more work to do. I mean, yeah. thank you for coming on, sharing your insight again. You guys got a good pole position in the market, and again, it's right on your doorstep, so congratulations. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with George Gilbert with more coverage in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV and Strata Hadoop after the short break.